blonde ambition time. Friendly reminder that this is actually part two, so go watch part one if you haven't already. And these are all of the trigger warnings as well. Don't forget I've got all of the resources in the description should you need it, because I never want you to have your day ruined by watching these videos. And yes, this gets really dark, but we are ending this on a high note as well. On filming for Niagara, she actually met a chambermaid who admired her shoes and how they actually had the same size feet. So Marilyn left shoes behind for her because that was just the kind of person that she was. She also didn't do the screams in the movie to protect her voice. It was actually a local that did that that Marilyn had become friends with. She would always be nice to the locals whenever she was on shoots, in a way kind of like making every place feel like a home. She was getting a little bit more infamous for being late though, which didn't really work in her favour. Now, she wrote this in her memoir. It makes something in me happy to be late. People are waiting for me. People are eager to see me. I'm wanted. And I remember the years that I was unwanted. All the hundreds of times that nobody ever wanted the little servant girl, Norma Jean not even her mother. People dislike me for such tardiness. They scold me and explain to me because it's because I want to seem important and make a spectacular entrance. That's partly true, but it's Norma that longs for the importance, not me. So you couple this with anxiety and perfectionism and like later on a pill addiction and an alcohol addiction, you're gonna get a late starlet. That's just what's gonna happen. But personally, I hate it when there's anything late, but like our versions of anxiety work very differently, clearly. <laughs> so on her birthday on the 1st of June in 1952, she actually got the role of Lauren like Lee in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and speculation was absolutely rife about her and Joe as well. If I wanted to get married now, I would. And if it already were, the studio's wishes would not be enough to make me keep it a secret and like we can fully see that that checks out from her track record as well, can't we? Women were also not really fond of like the confident Marilyn that actually felt comfortable in her body as well and the way that she dressed. So she wrote an article called, Am I too daring? In all my adult life, I preferred to dress for men rather than women. I'm beginning to feel like a piece of statuary that people are inspecting with a magnifying glass and looking for imperfections taking apart everything about me. And the thing is, this still very much happens today. Seriously, the sooner that we stop obsessing with how each other looks, the happier we'll be. <laughs> Seriously. So in the article, she also was saying how much she longed for a female friendship. Now, honestly, here's my whole take on this situation, okay? We can see from Marilyn's upbringing that she did have some positive female-like influences in her life. But there weren't really any lengthy relationships with people that weren't part of like her family, like or extended family, so to speak. And you can't really have girl talk with family members now, can you? Girls at her school bullied her, and the only positive attention that she got was from men and boys when she was like looking a certain way, acting a certain way. And so, of course, in like your little child monkey brain that is growing up, especially a traumatized child monkey brain, uh, you're gonna start thinking like, oh, okay, this is where I get the positive reactions from, so of course you're going to do more of the things that get you the positive reactions. And regardless of if it comes to men or women, you're just going to do more of that thing. And the thing is, I think that she also knew that men are the ones in power, and they're the ones that were actually able to do stuff for her to help her. So it's like, out of the two, the ones that are catty towards me, or the ones that objectify me, but then also can get me places, which one am I going to pick? Like, I do understand, like, her struggles with wanting female friendships because it's like she she did, from reading everything that she's written, she definitely did want to have female friendships. I do totally get her going over to that side and being like, well, men are where the power is, I'm gonna do what it takes to make me powerful. So in September of 1952, she moved again and visited Joe often, finally starting to feel settled in life. To a reporter, she actually said, I'm trying to find myself now, to be a good actress, a good person. Sometimes I feel strong inside, but I have to reach in and pull it up. You have to be strong inside, way deep down inside of you. It isn't easy. Nothing's easy. As long as you go on living. Honestly, she's just the most melancholy person I've ever come across. So filming for Gentlemen for the Blondes, everybody wanted a feud between Marilyn and Jane Russell, but like, they weren't having any of it. If anything, Marilyn just clung to Jane, like a dear mentor friend. Jane was from a good family with a good surrounding network around her and a strong head on her shoulders. And she was actually a really, really positive inspiration for Marilyn during that time. Like, so she would actually help make sure that she actually got out of her like dressing room and everything in the morning. It was like really, really good that Jane was actually on set with her. For the entire thing, Jane made $150,000 and Marilyn was only getting $750 a week. Now this she could handle, but she didn't have her own dressing room. But the studio kept on telling her, but you're not a star, you don't deserve a dressing room. Look, it's gentlemen prefer blondes. 
and I'm the blonde. Whatever I am, I'm the blonde. And they gave her the robe that Betty Grable used to use. So there you go, it finally worked. So it was a hair that she had learned and heard the works of Ella Fitzgerald for the first time as well. Now I just wanna clear up this story because we've all seen this picture right here, right? Yep, you all recognize it? Yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. Um, it's a lie. <laughs> I just, I have to clear this up because it's really bothering me. And yes, this is jumping a few years ahead, but you know, whatever. So Marilyn did indeed use her power to help Ella Fitzgerald, but it's not quite as activist-y as you might think. There were other black singers that had sung at the club before Ella. However, the thing is that Ella wasn't glamorous enough. Like, she was older, she was bigger, and it's just like, oh, well, she's not going to attract any audience to our club, so why would we want to hire her when they had literally hired other black people to sing there before? So Marilyn called up the famous West Hollywood club, Macambo, and she asked to get them to let her sing there for just a week, and Marilyn would turn up every single day, be at the front with all different friends every time. So yes, the viral image is partially true, but like Marilyn wasn't like this perfectionist of an activist as much as like what people like to think. Uh, my hair is different. We just had a duckling saving mission in this household, so <laughs> apologies. <laughs> Carrying on. Welcome to our little vegan life. <laughs> So during filming Diamonds Are A Girl's Best Friend, Natasha Lightus of course kept coming back onto the scene, um, especially literally on the scene, uh, directing <laughs> Marilyn behind the backs of the two men that were actually directing her. So this is where there were issues with Howard Hawks. From what I've actually heard as well, he's not the nicest man. And also the choreographer, Jack Cole. So Marilyn was getting direction from Natasha instead of these two, and she tried to handle the situation as best she could to like make sure that everyone was happy. Like Marilyn's nerves and anxiety were like so intense that it literally made her like tremble between takes it's what like the backup dancers would see they'd just see her like frozen in spot like <laughs> we've been there right i've been there i was there on my wedding day and it was just like with 35 other people but i was terrified yeah like she was still turning up late which jane did help with because she was like come on blondie it's time to go and just like rally her um which was actually really helpful and jane did try and make friends with her but marilyn didn't feel very comfortable around the group of friends so she just was like, mm, this isn't really for me. Like, Jane did honestly try and help, and they did have a good friendship as well. Uh, Jane even went to, like, go help her decorate her house in the future, so, yeah. <laughs> now, Marilyn wore the gold dress that you see, like, two seconds of in this movie, because it was too sexy, because don't forget, this is after, like, the whole nude photo scandal. She wore that to the Photo Play Award, and none other than Joan Crawford took great offence at her wearing this, and made some really off-colour remarks to a reporter, which she didn't realise was actually being recorded, but hey, nothing's ever really off the record. This deeply hurt Marilyn because Marilyn had actually like made a friendship with Joan Crawford in the past uh, but she didn't feel worthy enough because Joan was like oh you can't go wearing this stuff like come to my house and tell me what you've got and then we'll be able to figure out like a way for you to dress properly but Marilyn had so few clothes at the time she felt too ashamed to admit to Joan Crawford like how poor she really was um so yeah she never did that but Joan was like so perturbed by like people's reactions she was like you're acting like I killed someone like this isn't the worst thing I could have ever said Marilyn's mother Gladys just makes a guest appearance again now turning up at Grace's house apparently marrying some random colonel as well he died before they could get a divorce to so Gladys stayed with Grace and it was like a huge um, impact on Grace's life like Grace's health wasn't good to begin with um but the extra strain of having to look out after Gladys, who you didn't know what behaviour to predict, like she was doing all stuff, like constantly belittling her, saying that she was stealing stuff, just being awful basically. All of this stress had Grace have a stroke. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> yeah, Gladys's mother then moved in with the Bollingers and Gladys had to be placed in permanent care at Rock Haven Sanitarium, which Grace had to arrange after a number of incidents, and Marilyn paid for her mother's expenses, but she really didn't see her any time after that. I can kind of understand, like, it's very hard to see someone suffer at the same time as a person that hates you, <laughs> like, and just go and get belittled. Yeah, it kind of makes sense why you wouldn't really want to go and see them. Learning to stand tall. Marilyn moved again to a three-bedroom apartment that Jane Russell actually helped her to decorate and painted her black grand piano white. And the thing is that she stayed there for nearly a whole year. Like, she loved things that were white, including white flowers, which is why we have this little tribute here. <laughs> now, How to Marry a Millionaire started to get filmed with three screen queens. So you've got Lauren Bacall, Betty Grable, 
and Marilyn. So Lighthouse was still interfering <laughs> and the press were always just trying to get like rivalry struck up between the three of them, which none of them were having a bar of. Lauren is very similar in the way of like Jane Russell in her very much of a direct approach to things, uh, but Betty Grable was way more understanding like being a fellow cheesecake girl, you know. Now, Marilyn did get hospitalized again and recovered at home, calling up Grace day and night. Joe's brother sadly died at this time as well, and it was actually during the condolences that he realized just how deeply he really cared for Marilyn. And on the 26th of June, 1953, she finally got her dream of like placing her hands in the cement at the Chinese theater, which is a place that she used to go to all the time as well as a kid. So the fact that she got to like live this lifelong dream, that's probably one of the main reasons I want to go to Hollywood actually. <laughs> She then started work on The River of No Return, but the director, Otto Preminger, was honestly a piece of work. According to like her other co-star and other people on set, he just bullied Marilyn no end, just being a total jerk. And like, I don't know if you've seen this movie, uh, <laughs> I'm sure not everyone's seen all of these movies, but the stunts in this are like really intense. And it includes this time where they're on a raft in like white waters, and she heavily sprained her ankle um, during this. And she was like hobbling around on set, and he just had no patience for her at all. Now also Natasha was still present on set, and if there's something that a big ego doesn't like, it's <laughs> being undermined, right? I mean, I, I I do understand like why people would be so mad at it. I would be mad at it if I was a director as well. Now, sadly as well, in 1953, Grace Goddard also passed away and Grace was such a like cementing force in Marilyn's life. This was just gut-wrenching for her. Now, she died of likely suicide by those dreaded barbiturates. Um, if you want to know any more about that, look at the Judy Garland video I've already done. Grace was like a replacement mother figure for Marilyn, so this this was probably like the hardest death that she had to like live by. And Marilyn had to have another gynecological surgery as well. And then in 1954, she just needed to take a break. She was just completely burnt out. Like you can see how her accolades have just built up suddenly, right? Marilyn's first trip overseas. So after all that had happened, Joe asked Marilyn to marry him, to which she of course said yes. Fun fact. This was actually a mole that was just raised so they could decide to cover it or make it pop. So there you go, another little tidbit for you. It was during this time that she also got the script for The Girl in Pink Tights, which was a terrible movie. And I'm really glad that she was like, ugh, I don't want to do this. Because uh, it was well below what she actually did for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And so she was like, well, why am I going backwards? I meant to be going forwards. And um, she knew it wasn't right and said no. And so Fox suspended her. 14th of January, 1954, she told Fox that she'd been getting married. In order to keep it with her contract, she had to tell them if she was going to get married. Technically, she actually did. It was only a few hours beforehand that she made the phone call, though. Uh, but you know what Fox did, even though she was suspended? Um, they got everyone to call everyone, and 500 people turned up outside the courthouse, though. This was exactly what Joe and Marilyn did not want. Like, Joe was incredibly private, as we know, and Marilyn just wanted to be able to, like, get married in private with him, as according to his wishes, because she seemed to do whatever, like, the men that she married wanted, which kind of destroyed her, but that's a separate thing we'll be talking about later. And on the whole marriage thing to Jo, um, she said, That was something I'd never planned or dreamed about, becoming the wife of a great man. Any more than Jo had ever thought of marrying a woman that seemed 80% publicity. The truth is that we were very much alike. My publicity, like Jo's greatness, is something on the outside. It has nothing to do with who we actually are. And as soon as they emerged, like, they just mobbed her with questions, her in particular. How many children are you going to have? Are you going to quit your career? Because, of course, like, a woman is not allowed to have a career at the same time as being married because oh, how would you have the time for anything? <sighs> to which she replied, what difference does it make? The studio suspended me. Again, round of applause, please. So they actually had to trick people from flitting from one place to another so then they just didn't get followed in order to be able to have, like, their little honeymoon getaway, you know? They went to Idleworld in a mountain hideaway and then Marilyn mysteriously broke her thumb before they flew to Japan for Joe's coaching trip. No one really knows exactly what happened, and there were, like, <sighs> whilst there's been a lot of speculation, there's been no proof that he was abusive to her, it's just, there's, there's a lot of bruises and stuff that happened to her, so we don't quite exactly know if this happened or not. But he was actually abusive towards his ex-wife, so... <laughs> She went out on the way to Japan. They got asked by someone that was high up in the army if uh, she could actually do a like, little impromptu tour to Korea. Initially, Joe thought that this question was aimed at him. As soon as the sergeant, colonel, whoever, was like, actually, it's for your wife. It's like, well, 
she decides it's her honeymoon um, and was obviously just like joking saying like if you want to do it then we can and so then that's how they were, ended up going to Korea which is how they ended up like with her not having the right clothes to wear at all on this trip as well so when they landed in Japan they were actually mobbed by people like this was more intense than anything Marilyn had ever dealt with like people were like clambering on each other pushing each other over to be able to get a picture of her like it was scary like she was genuinely scared and when they left Japan to go to Korea Marilyn visited the GI hospitals like she lay on the ground with them she had those really good talks like there's and then she went and did like the four nights um, of shows as well with like that band Anything Goes I think is their name where she was wearing the infamous deep purple dress some think it's blue some think it's purple I would more call it an indigo but you know whatever she never felt like a movie star before going to Korea and seeing how much of a difference she made to all of these people and she said to Joe he never heard such screaming to which he just replied yes I have like what is it with the men in her life just being so dismissive of her achievements my god this is the thing that just irks me so much about every single one of her husbands. I'll do better. So after landing back in America and writing to Joe that she'd quote unquote do better for him, she went to go see a psychic Kenny Kingston who she saw until she died. She also signed with a famous artist agency at this point and that got Fox to drop the girl in pink tights, have Marilyn instead go on to the musical There's No Business Like Show Business and sign on to the seven year itch which made her super happy <laughs> and she got a million dollar um, signing thing for that as well. Now she also had been working on an autobiography which got released to to another magazine like all sorts of deals kind of fell through there it got published in 1974 which is called my story which of course i own actually this is really good um i do recommend if you are a fan and you like this sort of stuff then go check it out in there's no business like show business um there was a height difference between her and the lead that she was meant to be romantically involved with so she had to keep on like kicking off her shoes each time that she had a scene with him nobody makes donald o'connor stand on a crate she also met hal schaefer during this time who was a vocal coach that she became romantically involved with um as her marriage started to like fall apart so she was turning up on set in bruises as well and she was late and still dealing with anemia and bronchial issues and joe barely turned up to see her except to see things like heat wave big mistake big huge out of all of the parts of the movie to see her in like the most provocative number probably wasn't the best move for an incredibly jealous person to see <laughs> yeah by the way she got pneumonia from her trip to japan and korea so yeah just Side note there. As soon as filming finished on There's No Business Like Show Business, it went straight on to the seven year itch. The movie that caused the divorce, even though like it gets blamed, but I really think it was due to like other issues. <coughs> Joe. I mean, you and I can see the writing on the walls, right? Yeah? Okay, cool. You can't just go blaming a movie and the fact that your wife is being objectified. <laughs> and Natasha was still there in all her overbearing glory <laughs> and the press were trying to poke cracks in the marriage as well because of course how could a working woman keep her husband oh no the perils <sighs> isn't it delicious those three words that spell doom <laughs> A crowd of people even though this was filmed at like 2 in the morning in New York heaps of people were there just gawking at her yelling at her to make it go higher higher they were not there for any acting chops they were just there to objectify her they were there as like a power play and it's like y'all are disgusting even after all of that pain and heartache they couldn't use any of that footage because they had to go to a different sound stage they had to just redo the whole thing all over again the damage had already been done and she turned up the next day to work with bruises on her back but we don't know how that happened I'm just saying what's been recorded about it. Whilst Joe went to San Francisco, she met some friends and decided that she had to divorce him. She didn't want alimony or property. She loved him, but she knew it just couldn't work. She hired Jerry Geisler and on the 4th of October, the papers got served. The next day, Joe left and despite wanting to talk to the press, Marilyn was too upset to. I'm sure that you'll have seen this as well. Like, it's heartbreaking. But guess what Joe did? He hired a private investigator <laughs> just because <laughs> that's the kind of jealous person he was. <laughs> he became incredibly obsessive and he even tailed the private investigator as well um, along with his friend Frank Sinatra. So they even broke into the wrong apartment as well, absolutely terrifying the people that lived there. And Marilyn was actually just above, like, and they were so scared as anybody would be. <laughs> I mean, come on. For someone who apparently didn't give a hoot about his wife, he sure was a controlling asshat. 
Then the next day, on the 6th of November, she w was meant to be attending something, so she went. And that was the time that she actually got to fulfill her dream and she danced with Clark Gable. And no, they were not an item. Reporters are just trying to sell you stuff. Like, they, they were never a thing. She then got given a really bad script and decided, you know what? I'm gonna do what Frankie says. I'm gonna do things my way. And she went to New York, New York. So she set up her own production company with one of her favorite photographers, Milton Green. But first she had to have another surgery because, hey, endo never stops, haha. <laughs> Hashtag why is there not enough research done in this area to stop women from having to suffer? Now, Jo actually did go to be by her side in hospital. The thing is that they did remain friends for their whole life, um, but they just were not compatible as a couple. New starry eyes. So New York was like a reawakening for Marilyn. So she actually went to stay with Milton Green, his wife and his child. She lived in secrecy with directing all of her business affairs except for her mother's over to New York, fired her agent Charles Feldman, and left Natasha none the wiser. 1955 rolls around, and on the 3rd of January, Marilyn had a meeting with the directors of her production company, Milton Green, Joe Carr, Frank Delaney. So Frank Delaney actually found loopholes in her contract with Fox that she could like wiggle out of. And when she returned for filming for the seven year itch, the media went wild. All she said was, I merely wanted the freedom to do the other kinds of roles too. Because when you look at all of the movies that Fox made her do, she really was doing the same typecast that Meg Ryan was doing in the 90s. She took up acting lessons, including with Lee and Paula Strasberg. Now those names will have pricked some ears of those ones that are in the know. They ran the actor's studio and taught the method where you basically have to become the character in order to be able to act the character, which has been kind of like a detrimental thing for many actors. Arthur Miller, 2.0. So Arthur was still married, but he fell quickly in love with Marilyn once again and she fell for him too. And they stole away some time together in her apartment. Now, New York was honestly a pretty happy time for Marilyn. Like when she was there, she really wanted to be able to retire there because, and, and she also wanted to live in Brooklyn because that's where you get the best views and she loved the streets. It, she just thought it was magical. And she started talking with Joe again too. And like, he desperately wanted her back, but he knew he had to be patient. Patience, go patience. But she did squash all of this though, because they went to the premiere of the Seven Year Itch together. I guess, honestly, that was more of like a publicity thing, because he would never normally go to those sorts of things if he could like wiggle his way out of it. So I think it was more of like showing a unified front. And the thing is, with her darling Arthur, she loved his work. So he was a playwright, if you didn't know. And like, she would go and see his plays all the time. And I think it was a view from the bridge. And she just thought it was a wonderful, intelligent, lovely person. He's also incredibly arrogant and elitist, but that's, that's later. <laughs> and he split up with his wife of October 1955, obviously to be with Marilyn. And literally on the last day of the year, on 1955, she got a new contract from Fox, stipulated that she makes four movies over seven years for them. She gets director approval, not story approval, and she could appear in other things that weren't involved with Fox. Like, no joke, this was actually huge. Like, this is massive, especially in the time where the studios used to literally own everything about an actor. So, like, props to her. Like, she actually made leaps and bounds in terms of, like, actors being able to get, like, I don't know, treated a bit more like a human <laughs> from the studios that just wanted to, like, churn out a machine. <laughs> Along came a prince. So the prince and the showgirl was a trying time, shall we say. So Sir Laurence Olivier, he thought that she was stunning and was at risk of falling in love with her when he first met her. I mean, that soured faster than milk on a hot day. And if you didn't know, he was married to none other than Vivian Lee, the person who used to play this role on Broadway. And there were two classically trained actors, so the elitism is just palpable. To clash with a newbie that was learning the method as well, um, and she had to like really be in the character, and yes, he did just want her to be sexy in this. Bye Mannix! <laughs> this is jumping ahead a little bit, but she would ask him during the production, it's like, why is the character doing this? Like, what's her motive? Like, why is she acting this way? And he would literally tell her, just be sexy, so... <laughs> Let's talk about bus stop. Now, she went back to LA after making this arrangement and agreement about the prince and the showgirl uh, to do what a lot of people actually regard as her best piece of acting. Paula Strasberg was actually on set this time instead of Natasha, but there was always still a person in her life trying to, like, 
control is that too hard a word <laughs> to say but it kind of feels like it and of course her beau arthur he had ties with a communist tainted organization in the 40s and they were like super sus about him wanting to get a passport to be able to go to the uk he wanted to go do work with the woman who will then be my wife referring to marilyn now they hadn't talked about this <laughs> Which I find really bizarre, like we talked about getting married, we talked about everything before we got married. Marilyn and Arthur Miller were driving on their way home, um, but obviously people were stalking them all the time. Now, he lived down like this kind of dirt road that was made for like a horse and cart, not to be driven down quickly. But there were reporters that were chasing them down, and a crash happened behind them and they saw the person die. And they were still expected to do a press conference afterwards. Um, you can see in this footage just how shaken up they both are, in particular Marilyn. And this was the day that they were getting married as well, so after this press conference they went to his house and got married, and they had a Jewish ceremony two days later after she had done some stuff to um, be, oh what's the word? Converted to Judaism? Now to make the prince and the showgirl. Oh, this hurts. Where well, London was really keen to get a piece of her. So they, they flew all the way across the UK and then they had to do two press conferences that same day. Oh my God, I cannot imagine anything worse. And then in the morning they had more press conferences to do, but Marilyn was late because she was talking to the locals. She got asked, what do you think about the seven year itch? And she replied, do you know, I never understood the point of that film. Me neither, Marilyn. Me neither. I hate it. Now when people asked Arthur Miller how he saw his wife, he replied with, with two eyes. <laughs> okay, I'll have to give credit where credit is due, that is really funny. People found out where Marilyn was staying and they were going to try and serenade her. I know it may seem like fun and games, but seriously, please do not base like your romantic gestures on what people in the 1980s movies did, okay? And Olivier, well, he was a patronizing person telling people to be patient with her because her methods aren't like everyone else's which you know just made her instantly not like him or trust him and she would refer to him as Mr. Sir from now on. Now the tabloids in the UK actually really grew to hate her as well because she kind of wanted to have some privacy to be able to rehearse and like I don't know, see the sights and stuff. Yeah, I, if you know anything about the toxicity in the UK tabloids and press, <laughs> yeah, they, they really went out to attack her, like, horrifically. They were terrible. Like, they are the most invasive, intrusive, like, careless people ever. Now, Marilyn was late on set basically every day, but it wasn't as long as you may think. It was normally around about the 30-minute mark. There were also many rumors of pregnancy during this time, but no, it was just endometriosis it's a plague like seriously it's always there <laughs> endometriosis is the worst like it affected her so much to the point where every single month at around about the same time she couldn't work as someone that suffers <laughs> with like terrible pain as well um i fully understand that and i wish that there was a lot more understanding in the way that employment agreements happen martha miller's writing about marilyn now I finally get to talk about why I really do not like him. So he wrote in his notebook all about the prince and the showgirl and how much he sided with Laurence Olivier and how disappointed and ashamed he was of his wife. His new wife, mind you, like they'd literally just gotten married. Great, huh? And the thing is that he left his notebook out. And so Marilyn read it and was utterly devastated. So she called and she confided in the Strasbergs about this and also the pianist who was like there to like help her like learn and sing and stuff didn't like Arthur Miller either <laughs> calling him incredibly arrogant he didn't like to talk to anyone um, that was beneath his station so to speak um, so basically an elitist asshat again. Marilyn she would talk to anyone literally anybody she didn't care what station you were she would just talk to you like like you're a real human being, not like demanding stuff of you. But you know, like during this time, because of all of the stress and the betrayal and not knowing who she could trust, she was also having her own like bouts of like just being incredibly angry, even getting really angry at that pianist as well. And her and the pianist, like they did make a friendship. Yes, you're probably putting two and two together about a certain movie. So they went out shopping and she would wear disguises for this. And they even went to Salisbury Cathedral. You could say this is this movie. <laughs> um, I actually really like it. I think that Michelle Williams did a really good job at portraying her respectfully. Now her reliance on pills and alcohol was actually increasing due to the stress. And a cop that was there to like protect her, apparently, was also acting as a spy for Olivier the whole... 
like the whole time, like documenting her comings and goings from the house. She never trusted him after that. Before she used to call him Mr. Plod or Officer Plod, he gets no nickname anymore. Marilyn was actually also challenging on set, like some people got a really bad impression of her, but there were others that really loved her during this time as well. For example, you've got Dame Sybil Thorndyke, who thought that she was just charming and lovely. I think that she honestly saw just how like nervous and afraid Marilyn really was. And then on the 29th of October in 1956, she met the Queen. Yes, the Queen, wearing possibly what is <laughs> the most risque outfit I've ever seen anyone meet the Queen in. <laughs> Obviously, after all the filming was done and her reflections on England years later were, it seemed to be raining the whole time. Or maybe that was just me. Wow. <laughs> Talk about my feelings about the UK. A place I'm probably never going to go back to unless I absolutely have to. <laughs> Playing house. With Marilyn playing house, they're able to like live their lives in the way that Arthur really wanted them to. This was a time where she finally did feel at home, because in the past she really did want to be a housewife. She took up a new psychologist called Mary Rees from Anna Freud's recommendation. Yes, that Freud. Marilyn loved Freud, like she was obsessed with his work. Milton Green decided that he was the executive producer of The Prince and the Showgirl, and Marilyn was having none of it. <laughs> and so he was just let go. But Arthur Miller was to blame for this as opposed to Marilyn. That's who Milton Green blamed, anyway. Now, <sighs> Arthur was still dealing with the court issues, with the whole, like, communist ties thing. And they wanted names, but obviously, like, he wouldn't give any because he didn't really know any. <laughs> this was one of the quietest periods in her life, actually. And they were just trying to be quote-unquote normal. So she fell pregnant, but then she collapsed a few months later because it turned out to be an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, which is, if you if you actually don't know what that means. It means that the baby is forming in the tube as opposed to in the womb. You can imagine the pain. So she left the hospital on the 10th of August of 1957. She's smiling in this and acting well, but we all know how much she and her husband would have been like mourning this loss. Like as soon as those like ambulance doors closed, like I bet that she was crying again. And she was honestly changed so much after this incident. She became even more anxious than she already was and uh, apparently also tried to OD in this time, and Arthur had to save her. In 1958 was about the same time she had the outline for a movie called Some Like It Hot come across her desk, and she knew it would be like a hit. She went to LA, and then a little later, when Arthur actually got cleared of his charges, and then he went over to join her. And they were happy together, but part of me is thinking that's because they were living in his bubble, right? Like, he wanted the quiet life. He wanted her not to work. He wanted to have like the nice little quiet household and stuff. So when love is conditional like this, it's not healthy is all I'm saying. She did all of this for two years with him. But remember the way that he treated her during The Prince and the Showgirl? Like how dismissive and embarrassed he was of her and how disappointed he was in her that whole time. But then as soon as she's filling like this role that he really wanted her to fill of being like this 50s housewife, he's like, oh, She's the best. I just... Time to turn up the heat too high. <laughs> Some like it hot. So Marilyn was the same as always on set, turning up late, struggling with her lines. Like, her addiction to pills and alcohol was getting worse at this point in her life as well. She actually really wanted to be back home and she fell pregnant again <laughs> during filming. And so all of this meant that Arthur had to ask Wilder to actually let her have the mornings off because, you know, that morning sickness is not fun. And she also had to be psychologically ready before coming out of her trailer as well. Now, these days we're much more understanding of that, but back in the day it was just like, um, excuse me, go. Um, but also, <laughs> I... I kind of want to point out a bit of a power imbalance here as well because I'm pretty sure a lot of you will be aware of all of the union action that's happening over in America right now around like stuff that's happening to the people that work behind the scenes effectively when it comes to movies and stuff. I fully understand people's hatred and frustrations when people are late on set because the amount of time and energy and effort and sacrifice that so many people have to do, it's, it's quite horrific honestly. So I do completely get um, why people would be frustrated with Marilyn for acting the way that she did. Um, kind of in like this diva-like way, even though it wasn't really intended as a diva thing. Arthur also had to carry her off set sometimes as well, because she was so ill. Um, and he was saying it was exhaustion, but a lot of it was actually due to like the pills as well, because she was still taking them while she was pregnant. Just like with The Prince and the Showgirl, the filming for this went over by weeks, and on the 17th of December it was confirmed publicly that she'd lost the baby. Her gyno even said that Miller was dismissive of her and treated her as an inferior. 
just furthering my attitude towards him. I'm sorry. How horrible is that? You lose a baby and then your husband is really dismissive and just being a dickhead. On the 22nd of December, she posed for Life magazine as various starlets, which is stunning. Oh my goodness, like, look at this. Um, but Christmas was not a happy time for her. Like, she had more pill use and depression, and she had an overdose to it. And the person by the name of Norman Rotson actually got called by her maid, and he asked how she was, and she said, Alive, bad luck. Like, she had more surgeries to try and get her to be able to have children, but there was so much scar tissue, abortions, and other issues that she'd never be able to have children, and Dr. Steinberg was the person who had to tell her. To which she replied, Thank you, doctor. I already know. Like, how grim, like, that's, ugh. Of her character. So you probably know that Marilyn was a person that they wanted to play Holly Golightly, right? Like, that was the person that they'd based the character off of. And I actually hated that book, but I know a lot of people like it because she came off as a terrible person. But you know, whatever, it's fine. Um, well, so she did consider it, but then she knew that her husband was working on, like, this love letter to her in the form of a movie called The Misfits. Have you heard of it? Have you watched it? The character he was writing, Rosalind, was actually about her. And so he used like things that happened in their real life to inform how he created this character as his valentine to her. Including the time that she was at the Roxbury farm with him and like a cow gave birth to a calf and so the children ran out to go get Marilyn because they're like, oh my gosh, she's gonna wanna see this, this is so amazing. And so she went out to go see it and it turned out to be a boy calf and vegans out there, you already know what's gonna happen. So the farmer just goes and grabs a sack because obviously a boy calf is a waste product and she flips out. She starts screaming and crying. You can't take the baby away from its mother. Just tears streaming down her face she runs inside tries to get money to like buy the calf off the farmer and he's just like that's just the way that business works here honey and she just she couldn't fathom it and she was utterly heartbroken so hey welcome to the journey to veganism it's a dark one when you see all of the cruelty that exists in the world for profit really is. There's this scene in The Misfits, if you've seen it, um, where they're out wrangling horses, right, and she acts in the same way. But the way that it's directed is to make us think less of her as a character for reacting this way to animal cruelty. Arthur, what the hell? <laughs> Seriously, what the hell? It is really painful to watch parts of that movie, honestly, because it is like, it's too close to the bone. The Misfits is one of my favourite Marilyn Monroe movies because she's great in it, but at the same time, it's, it's really painful to watch in the same way that I love Almost Famous, but it's really painful for me to watch that movie as well. Like, it's one of those bittersweet things that you almost can't take your eyes off it. Let's make a torrid affair. So Marilyn went back to LA to film Let's Make Love, which had Eve Montard starring alongside her, um, even though there was like a bit of a kerfuffle with who would actually be starring in this role. Now Arthur rewrote the script a bit too because, hey, nothing quite says controlling husband like a man stepping into his wife's work. She said that Eve was the most handsome man she'd ever met, next to her husband, of course. <laughs> and in 1960, after the holidays, they actually began working on the movie. And Marilyn was late. Um, she was still nice to everyone, um, for the most part, but being late so often, like, people are just going to get mad at you. Like, seriously, like, <laughs> I would not be impressed either. And so the thing is that with Fox, because this is a Fox picture, hence all of, like, the things looking the same, and Marilyn's illnesses actually stopped her from being able to work all the time as well. Basically, a bunch of things really impacted the movie, and Eve actually had to be in Japan by a certain date, like, to be able to fulfill a contract. Otherwise, they'd have to, like, pay $120,000. So everyone was getting work 24-7, which isn't healthy. It got missed, so Eve still had to pay that money, but then Fox reimbursed him for it, so nobody was happy with Marilyn. Because of course Fox wanted to have a scapegoat for everything else that was going wrong with their studios, so they just started blaming Marilyn. Now Marilyn did start to be a bit more mean, quiet, and distant from people as well that she was working with, and that reputation actually made everybody frightened of working with her, which again, just made her feel worse. Now, do I need to have a refresher course for people on what happens to people when they're depressed or burnt out or dealing with an anxiety attack? Because all of the behaviours that she's exhibiting are when someone is on like a brink of collapse. Um, as someone that's been there, as someone that's seen other people that's there, it's like, this is just mental illness like really rearing its ugly head because we know from the past that she was always really lovely to people so this time it's like, 
oh, okay, something's really wrong. <laughs> like, it's just interesting to see her to go from such a scared people pleaser to someone that was being mean to people because she couldn't cope anymore. And, like, she was just feeling this level of inadequacy on her because she couldn't remember lines. She was really, really exhausted because of all of the pills and the alcohol and just everything else. Like, she honestly shouldn't have been filming at this point. When Arthur had gone back to work, her and Eve Montard had this, um, torrid affair, shall we say. She said that he was very, very romantic and a quote that everyone could see. And he said that he would marry her if she wasn't already married, which his wife could see. Subtlety is just lost on you people completely. Um, but of course, like, just like Summer Love, it just died as soon as the movie was done. And no time to waste now because, you know, chop chop, her husband wants his movie made now. Marilyn's Misfits. So I could honestly do an entire video on this movie, but I'm just going to keep this very brief. Because honestly, it was a love-hate letter from Arthur to Marilyn, and the symbolism that's used in it is uh, very telling. So Marilyn is actually wearing a wig in this movie because the desert would be like ruining her hair and then also you've got to remember that she was bleaching her hair all the time. Like I never saw roots on this woman. Um, so it was kind of having an effect on that as well as all of the pills. So her hair wasn't really in like that great condition by this point in her life. But of course like the main problem was that she was unwell. She was honestly exhausted after filming Let's Make Love and then she had anemia and really low iron levels as well. And dealing with that pill addiction too, he includes things like the reason why Rosalyn, Rosalyn, uh, left her husband was that he wanted to have children and she didn't, which is literally a reflection on exactly what happened between Joe and Marilyn. And it's like, are you serious? <laughs> really? In a movie for everyone to see? Now, the one part where he puts her in a positive light is where she's tending the gardens and making a home and everyone's like, oh, you're looking so well. And it's like, it's just putting a spotlight on her as he wants her to be and trying to praise that and I'm like hmm until I knew all of this stuff behind it like that seemed to be like way more wholesome but now I'm just like this is just a form of control and belittlement like oh it's disgusting she gets manhandled really badly and has everyone fall in love with her like honestly it just puts Rosalind in like this light where she's a really stupid person has no idea about anything and is basically a fool and I really really do not like it and honestly, Arthur and Marilyn were as good as split during the making of this movie. Like, they barely talked when they were just them together, like, even in their apartment. And then when they were on set, they were just cordial to each other. So it's like, what was even the point about making this Valentine someone that you clearly do not love anymore? Like, the people of Reno saw her out and about, and she just looked exhausted and downtrodden, and they just felt really, really sorry for her whenever they saw her. But she did have it written into her contract that she didn't have to work during like one week of every month because of her endo. And during that week she flew back to LA and like her doctor was just like, oh my god, you have to, like you're exhausted, you have to have a bed rest week. And so that's what happened and then she flew back and carried on working because everyone really wanted to keep working. Okay, so Clark should not have been working and she was blamed heavily for his death because he died shortly after filming this as well so he was 59 he had ill health as well and he was a man's man you know he was a movie star of the th 20s and 30s and so of course <laughs> he had to do his own stunts now if you've seen the misfits you'll know that there are like really intense stunts that get done and he does all of this himself i would not do these at my age let alone at 59 and dealing with health issues like he was he, honestly this movie just shouldn't have been made all around it was really really bad and shortly afterwards he had a heart attack and died of that and everyone blamed Marilyn for it like literally everybody including his family and because he's her idol this just broke her even more <laughs> Like, their marriage was fully over at the end of filming, and she just stayed by herself playing sad songs and in, like, a really deep depression yet again. She was dealing with her third divorce, being accused of killing her idol, not having a baby that she desperately wanted, her company being on the brink of falling apart due to the divorce as well. Like, there was nothing that seemed to go right for her. And this leads up to Christmas of that year as well with Joe DiMaggio actually sending her poinsettias, knowing that she'd call him directly as thanks for doing that. She also reconnected with a publicist who worked on the bus stop movie, Patricia Newcomb, and they had Christmas together at Marilyn's house, and Patricia actually was like a bit of a friend in Marilyn's sadly last days. 1961, Hereditary. So Joe and Marilyn reconnected, but more like friends this time. They had to quash any rumors that they were gonna get back together, like, 
with Joe admitting that I'd have divorced me too. She got the official divorce from Arthur Miller on the night of John F. Kennedy's inauguration so she could do so in privacy. Smart cookie. But her mental health was struggling and she was visiting the psychologist a huge number of times and when Kay Gable blamed her for his father's death, she prepared, like she opened the windows ready to jump out of where she was living. The only reason that she didn't was because she saw someone that she knew down there and she didn't want to disturb them. And don't forget, like, she was living alone at this time too. So she went to the actor's studio and took lessons, but was incredibly reflective and, like, pensive and just withdrawn, basically, after all of this. In February, she got admitted to Payne Whitney Hospital under the advice of rest and care, but she didn't know that this was a quote-unquote mental institution, and this absolutely terrified her, especially after, like I said, all of the stuff that had happened in her family. So she thought that she was getting left there to die, and this is where things get really screwed up. She was kept in the prison cell-like room with the bathroom even being under lock and key and she was asked why aren't you happy in here to which she replied I'd have to be nuts if I liked it in here. She couldn't make a phone call to the Strasbourg's and she thought of a way to get their attention would be to like do exactly what Nellie did and don't bother to knock you know like the the person with all of the mental health issues she thought that imitating her would make sense uh, to get attention. She threw a chair up against the glass pane as many times as she could to be able to get like a chip out of it to like self-harm in order to be able to like get people to actually listen to her. Uh, but all this did was get her humiliatingly dragged by four people up to the seventh floor where the dangerous people were kept. She was finally allowed to write a letter to the Strasbergs, but they couldn't do anything, but they got Joe to actually step in. And he threatened to take the hospital apart brick by brick if they didn't release her into his care. And she drafted up a document with her lawyer that three people, including Joe DiMaggio, had to be notified before she could be put into care ever again. As she left, she told them, you should all have your heads examined. Finally, a free woman. Marilyn never trusted that psychologist again. She was meant to be working on a show called Rain, but her illness paused there, and she went to Florida with Joe, which is a place that she had been to before, actually, with the Kennedys. Um, so she actually met a young journalist who she loved the work of, um, called Lynn, and she told her all about the Kennedys and how she had visited Florida before, though nothing of their affair, mind you. And Kay Gable actually asked Marilyn to visit them to see their baby, and clearly had forgiven them or like just completely forgotten about the fact that they blamed Marilyn for the death of Clark. <laughs> Then she had to have another gynecological surgery. Endo really is the gift that keeps on giving. But she had a new lease of life, buying all new clothes, losing weight, getting a haircut shorter, like just doing things differently. And she just felt great. Like she actually had some hope again in her life and she was getting over like her third divorce and it's just like, I can do what makes me happy now as opposed to what makes someone else happy. So she actually went and started hanging out with the Rat Pack. You know, you know who they are, like Frank Sinatra and stuff. And so in June she had her gallbladder removed and when she was leaving hospital fans were jostling and grabbing at her so much she was afraid that her like incision would come open again. This is what I mean when it comes to please treat celebrities like people. Pe we're all people, honestly. What the hell? She was going back to New York and the plane had some troubles and had to turn around and she was really worried and was just like, I need to sort out my will. And all she could think about was her will and Joe. And she called Joe up and said, I love you, I think, more than ever. So Marilyn moved back to LA, but privacy was of the utmost concern. Dr. Greenson told her to ditch all of her friends um, because he said that they were trying to use her, and I don't really think so. I think a Dr. Greenson was probably trying to use her, honestly. And he thought it would be quote unquote good for her to be part of a functioning family, so he was like, just live with me and my family. This is not creepy at all. Honestly, any psychologist today would be like, absolutely horrified at this happening. So he found out that she was on Demerol, a barbiturate, and also Amitril. Now Demerol in particular should not be used long term, and she was getting multiple prescriptions from multiple different places as well, which is a really dangerous practice, oh my god. Now Dr. Greenson actually got Eunice Murray to be her housekeeper, as he knew her well, and she had actually helped him out with other patients in the past as well, which is a little bit dodgy when you think about it. So Marilyn was actually still working during this time, like just no movies, like The Misfits was the last movie that she ever made, like and completed, shall we say. Um, but she was still doing like interviews, she was doing like all sorts of stuff. Like I said before, during this time she was still getting pictures taken of her, doing all this publicity stuff, but she would also destroy pictures that she didn't like and didn't want people to use as well. So it's like this level of like self-consciousness was still rife in her even then. 
1962, her final home. So she moved into a Spanish Renaissance style home in Brentwood. Like, you know, the one that we'll all know from my video on Anna Nicole Smith, right? <sighs> you know what's going to happen, but this doesn't make it any easier. This was very challenging to write. The tile on the porch at the front said, Cursum Perficio, sorry if I'm butchering that, which translates to, I finished my journey, which must have honestly meant something to the woman that had spent all of her life bouncing from place to place, person to person, contract to contract. Family to family, almost. She was really busy remodeling the house as well and trying to make it her home. She went to Mexico, but she was on a watch list for going to Russia, and so the FBI actually followed her. Like, she really wanted to adopt this young boy as well, but then she, like, decided against it because clearly she was like, oh wait, no, I don't think I actually can handle this. She also went to an orphanage there as well, and she gave them $10,000 instead of taking a baby back with her. She was clearly going through some stuff right now. Something's got to give. Her very last unfinished feature and last movie she was going to make for Fox. So the director hired her psychologist, Dr. Greenberg, uh, to be able to help with Marilyn on set, which got the producer replaced by Dr. Greenson's friend. So Marilyn, she said to someone that was on set, isn't it a terrible thing about life that there must always be something we must live up to? Like, I think this question honestly perfectly sums up <laughs> Marilyn's entire life everybody's image of her, who she should be, who they wanted her to be, but nothing about the real her. And she even said like something along the lines herself of like the fact that she was built up so high but with no foundations underneath. And it was those foundations which was the thing that she kept on trying to build herself and fix and do whatever she could. Marry someone else, do something else, be part of a different project, um, but it just never worked for her because she never had those foundations. She was just a person and that's all that anyone can really be. Like, it's just the expectations from others that can really, like, destroy you. So old friends did come and visit her, but she didn't really want to say goodbye. Like, she would beg them to stay as well. She had, like, all sorts of offers come through at this time, and she did other photo shoots during this time as well. And guess who also cropped it during this time? Natasha Lytus with a tell-all as well, which some stuff couldn't even be published because it was just that scandalous and personal. It was like... Natasha Lighthouse was a trash person. She got paid how much? About $10,000 for this? Now, on the 19th of May, she had her famous performance for President Kennedy's birthday. <laughs> You'll want to know about this affair, right? Like, so many people have made videos like, the huge scandal, the Maryland tunnels. It gets referenced in movies all the time. It's like all over the place. Like, oh my God, she slept with the president and his brother and oh my God, it was ah. Like, um, the thing is that nothing's ever been conclusively confirmed about this. Yes, they spent time together. It may well have happened? We don't know. And the thing is, it kind of feels really icky to capitalize off two people that are, have died in really tragic ways and just kind of like try and make a spectacle out of this when there's nothing that's confirmed about it and it, it just feels really tacky and I don't like it when people do that. So all I'm going to say is it's inconclusive. You can make your own mind up about it. Um, and also, can we just remember them when they were alive doing things that they enjoyed instead? Maybe? That would be great. <laughs> now, she went back to filming for Something's Gotta Give, including the, the first, that <laughs> never been done before, nude swimming scene, um, because like she was trying to rekindle that whole flame about her being a sex object because, hey, internalized male gaze is always there. And she loved how it turned out. She loved how all sorts of things turned out on set. Now, she did work on her 36th birthday on the 1st of June, but then after like going to a charity event and then the next day she was utterly inconsolable, like, Dr. Greenson actually had to fly back from Rome without his wife in order to be there with her. So Marilyn also did her Vogue photo shoot in this time that you'll have definitely seen, and the Cosmopolitan one. She did, like, some really beautiful photo shoots during this time. She also went back to hospital. It may have been a... It may have been an abortion, it may have been endo again. Who the hell knows? Who the hell cares? Um, but everyone really speculates on this, thinking, Oh my god, it's Bobby Kennedy's, or oh my god, it's Kennedy's. Um, but we don't know, and the thing is, it's her own medical records, it's hers, and she didn't, she was quite a private person. So her last interview was during that summer, which was published on the 3rd of August. It was of her calling out the studios for their poor treatment of people and the fact that fame is a burden. Interesting with the fact that that was, like, the last interview that she ever made. And then we've got the Cal Never weekend. Now, nobody really knows exactly what happened during this time, but, like, it was with Frank Sinatra, Peter Lawford, and his wife Patricia. Like, there are photos of it out there, but... Marilyn never actually called a psychologist during this time, so no matter what happened, it can't have been that bad. Uh, but there is 
so much speculation about this. Now she was having negotiations with Fox on the 3rd of August in 1962 and she also got liver injections, a prescription refill, she went to dinner with Pat Newcomb, you remember that friend from before, who actually had bronchitis and Marilyn was like, no you come stay with me, you'll feel better if you bake it out in the sun next to the pool. And then on the 4th of August, um, she mostly like chilled at home and like was working on like renovations with people, people kept on calling and stuff, like there is a full timeline of exactly what happened at this time, I don't really want to go over it too much, um, like the one thing I want to say is that she had a phone call with one of her friends, Norman Rotson, and she said let's all start to live before we get old which is a thing that really stuck with him. Dr. Greenson really wanted her to actually go to stay with him at the beach house uh, because he didn't think that she was well and she decided not to. The last thing that she said was at nine o'clock that night saying to Eunice, remember Eunice? Eunice? Whatever her name is? Um, just saying to her, like, I think we'll not go to the beach, Miss Murray. I think I'll turn in now. And that was the last anybody saw her. On the 5th of August is when the frenzy starts with her being discovered at the early hours of the morning. Um, before the sun even rose. Um, Dr. Engelberg was there and called the emergency services and when the ser but when the sergeant arrived he saw Eunice doing washing and it's like really? <laughs> really? <laughs> now the whole thing is like a really patchy investigation no one really knows exactly what happened um, but it's basically guaranteed that her cause of death was an overdose. Um, whether it was accidental or not, this had happened quite a few times to Marilyn during her life because she was mixing champagne and pills and she was still struggling even though she was definitely on an upwards turn. I don't really like to talk about exactly how people died anyway and I don't like to talk about all of that stuff. I just want to talk about like how the media and people handled this in particular. So Joe was trying to organise the funeral and was really worried about making sure that the right people were invited and he just wanted it to be a very small affair because he didn't really want to have everybody out there like clambering for it. Um, so. He said, please remember the gay, sweet Marilyn and send a prayer from the confines of your home or church. So she wore a green dress and her makeup artist, Whitey, did her makeup as she'd, requ as she'd requested. And after the mourners left, like, Joe was the last person to leave, people stormed in. Like, they were stealing things, trampling on everything. Guards had to stop them from attacking the tombstone, like, from attacking the tomb itself. Like... That's what I mean when I say like people were in this wild frenzy, like she couldn't even die without people tearing everything apart. Now the thing is that her death actually had a huge impact on a number of people with I think it was four separate people. Like, there were people from all around the world that were just found this news shocking and terrible and they tried to take their lives including like teenagers including a star like people were understanding why she did it and so this started this whole thing off um which is awful and tragic and honestly if any of this has started like getting these thoughts come into your mind i will obviously have resources down below for you please do not let this make you feel helpless at all. I want to end this video in a more positive way. All I'm saying right now is like I don't want any of you to leave this feeling really hopeless or anything so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna run through all of her movies so you can remember her while she was alive doing what she loved to do instead. Um, I'm not gonna go into the bit part ones because honestly I think that you can really skip them. So you've got 1948 with the ladies of the chorus. This was her first movie in a role bigger than a bit part. She didn't like it but she got to sing and dance in it and it was the beginning. Honestly, I personally think it's really cute. I like her outfits in it and I think that she did really well in it. Like, you can quite clearly see, like, the internalised criticism that she was battling with at the time as well. In 1950, All About Eve, um, yeah. I know that she wasn't one of the starring roles. I'm making a bit of an exception here, but she was amazing. Please go see that movie, no matter what. It's so good. 1952 with Don't Bother to Knock. Like, dang. If you want to get chills and feel a bit disturbed and be able to see Marilyn act in a way that you didn't know that she could, Go watch that movie. In 1952 there's Niagara, like it's pretty good, she plays a really good villain in this. It's quite a slow movie as a lot of like 1950s movies are, um, and of course it's got the longest walk in cinematic history, uh, just because everyone really loved to watch her walk because hey, what else? <laughs> oh and also, um, if you don't want to watch the whole movie, just watch her sing Kiss and then you'll understand why everybody fell in love with her and thought of her as like this sex object. 
Then you've got 1953 with Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. One of my favourites. I want every single costume out of this. Especially the things that get overlooked all the time are like the suits that she wears. And also this jade purple and pant number that she wears. Oh my gosh. So good. Every outfit. It's just such a fun movie. And her chemistry with Jane Russell is probably like the best thing about it really. They've got 1953 with Hail to Marry a Millionaire. Which is fun. Just like so fun. Three women scheming how to get money from like terrible men here for it. Gold. So good. 1954, The River of No Return. Like, I like parts of this, but just knowing how much pain she was in, it just really ruins it. Honestly, you can just watch her singing, like, on clips on YouTube, and you'll be fine. <laughs> you can skip this one. Um, 1954, There's No Business Like Show Business. Um, so if you like 1950s Hollywood musicals, then you'll like this, but if you don't, then you'll hate it. Honestly, again, I just say watch the parts where she's singing on YouTube, uh, because, like, she's not really featured all that much in it, and it just kind of feels like she's used for one thing and that's really it. 1955 The Seven Year Itch. I hate this movie so very much. I really really do. But I'll tell you what, that wardrobe, oh I want it so bad. It's so cute. It's basically any way to objectify someone and I really really hate this movie. Um 1956 with Bus Stop. The movie that most people say is like one of her best acting roles and I love the way that they did her makeup on this as well. Like her and Whitey actually worked together on it and they did a fantastic job with this. It does have animal cruelty in it though. I will warn you of that. Like I personally skip over those parts because I can't handle it but like just seeing her acting in this is really good. 1957 The Prince and the Showgirl. <laughs> the one that I haven't seen yet because I couldn't get it on DVD. 1959 with Some Like It Hot. Amazing. Great gangster comedy movie. Oh my gosh. Go watch it. If Even if you don't think that Marilyn's a great actress, like, this movie is fantastic. I love it. 1960 with Let's, with Let's Make Love, which I actually really like. Like, I, I really like the way that this movie is done. And this ombre pink dress, can I please own it? Um, her chemistry with Eve is like, palpable obviously and it's it's just a cute little romp um if you're after like that sort of like romance kind of movie that kind of tackles the elitism in the art world as well and then you've got 1961 with the misfits um again this is a really good movie which kind of pains me to say but also it's one of those ones that hurts to watch <laughs> so just as a forewarning for you it hits me like a gut punch each time and it makes me cry each time so there you go <laughs> Um, there's also animal cruelty in this one, so a warning for you, I skip over those parts as well. That's it, baby! We're done! I really want to close this video out whilst doing a better version of my makeup by saying that Marilyn really was just a person, same as we all are, but she wasn't treated as one for so much of her life. That's why I really wanted to make these videos the way that I did, to talk about her and her life and not try to make a spectacle out of her. She's been a dear person to me personally, in whatever way a person actually can be that you've never met, because when I was in my darkest times, I could actually finally have someone to relate to during my sycamore and deep depression times of my life life and I'd be lying if I said I don't still deal with those issues because they never really go away. It's not like going to therapy and like boom like magic your brain is fixed. It's a continuous thing that needs to be worked on and working on these videos has honestly been quite triggering to me and it may have been for others which is again why I'm saying that there are resources in the description box below. I know I've been repeating it but it's very important to say. Marilyn was actually full of hope still. She wanted to make people smile. She wanted to be lovely. She was a strong person despite feeling weak a lot of the time inside. She made great strides from the acting industry and tried to use her power well. She created herself and was created to be the ideal. People in the comments that I've seen of any videos I've been on, they praise her femininity, beauty, innocence, class, and charm. But we all know from these videos that she worked on creating this image, and she spent her life trying to live up to it and what people wanted her to be. Never actually got to be old. She feared it greatly, especially after the age of 30. She was scared about not being seen as a sex symbol anymore, with the new young actresses always coming up. And that's a tragedy that honestly still lives on today, which is why I've made that ageism video that I keep on telling you all to watch. It's very important. Please watch it. With her passing away at the young age of 36, we never got to see what else she would do, how she would handle getting older in a time where it was unacceptable for a woman to do so, how she would change the movie industry again. 
I believe one of the key reasons so many of us still love her today was that her vulnerability was so obvious all of the time. She was a very raw person who, like all of us, wanted to be wanted. She's a beautiful person who struggled with mental health issues and people wanted to save her in the way that we want others to save us too sometimes. But were it not for her beauty and youth, I personally think she would have been treated very differently and wouldn't have even been known by us. Now, honestly, this just leads into another video that's been brewing in my head for months about the portrayal of mental health health issues, so I'll leave that for another time. She's probably the most famous tragic icon that's ever existed, and I hope these videos have shown why. Now look, I may have gotten things wrong, <laughs> She like she did actually have rhinoplasty, but those records have only just gotten released, and thanks to the subscriber who pointed that out. Of course, if I've messed up, please feel free to correct me. I've honestly tried my best to be thorough, but obviously I can't capture every moment of her life, but all of the sources are in the description box below. I want to end this video on one quote from her belong to the public and to the world, not because I was talented or even beautiful, but because I'd never belonged to anything or anyone else. The public was the only family, the only Prince Charming, and the only home I had ever dreamed of. Um, there probably are five lipsticks on my lips right now actually, so accurate. Yes, there were five layers of lipstick on her lips. <laughs> I just really hope that you've liked these videos and the next one is going to be a short video but do let me know down below who you want me to cover next so I've got people wanting Pamela Anderson, I've got people wanting Amy Winehouse, some people wanted Lindsay Lohan but I almost feel like I want to wait until like she's even more settled than what she is right now. I still feel like she's in a temporary state. I don't feel it's right to do Britney until she's fully able to live the life that she wants to lead um, but yeah if there's other people that you want me to cover like even a happy one would be great. Maybe like Dolly Parton. Just saying, that's always an option. Anyway, lovelies, thank you so much and I'll see you again next time. Bye.